From Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City, Gallery, Bar, Book, and Games, it's a Jacob Media Eagles pregame show with Mark Farzetta, Derek Gunn, and Eagles Hall of Famer, Mr. Seth Joyner. So much to get into today with today's matchup as the Eagles look to improve to 11-1 and on the season as they take on the 7-4 and Tennessee Titans. A lot to get into when it comes to A.J. Brown taking on his former team. We got Jordan Davis's return. How are the Eagles going to at least attempt to stop Derrick Henry? But let's start it off on the injury front as it does look like our man Jordan Davis will be in the middle of that line of scrimmage with a lot of veterans that have been added to the fray by Howie Roseman. Gunnar, I'll start with you. What are the early reports on Jordan Davis, and what can we expect from him today? Well, I checked with a few people earlier today, and they said he's ready to go. Now, he had mentioned in the latter part of last week that he's dropped 20 pounds from his frame. I'm looking forward to seeing a skinny Jordan Davis, if we can call 320 skinny instead of 3-4. Wait a minute. He dropped 20 he pounds dropped 20 in pounds. three weeks? Yes. Drop 20 pounds. I guarantee you, if you look behind him, you'll find it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but, as, you know, I was, told, I was told this morning, I said, he's ready to go. I said, what does that mean? He is ready to go. Wow. You know, that means he's he's back in shape, no limitations whatsoever. Now, how many plays he's going to play this game? He's considering he's missed the last four. That remains to be seen what kind of game shape he's in. Well, I mean, listen, he's been averaging, like, 20 to 26, 27 plays. Right. I would still wouldn't expect for him to play – any more than that, probably 15, 20 max. They got enough depth at that position now that he doesn't have to play a whole lot. Okay, one of the problems or one of the concerns people had with Jordan Davis coming out of the draft was his weight and not in the decreasing worry. It was more in the increasing worry. So, Gunnar, you're telling me that right now we're at a point where he's 20 pounds lighter than what he was before he went on the draft. Before, yes. you, before yes. you even answer that, man, I don't know what, he, what <laughs> regiment he was on. But I'm going over to the Novacare when I leave here today. Seth, I'm getting on that program. Seth, Seth, modern technology has changed from when you played. 20 pounds yes. in three weeks? Yes. Four weeks? Yes, four weeks. Well, a little bit more than four weeks. Man, let Think me tell you. It. I see when y'all see me next week, I ain't gonna look the same. <laughs> wait, wait, like a track wait, star. wait. Will we be looking at bigger Seth? No, or smaller Seth. No, I'm coming down, way down. Are you kidding me? If he come down 20 pounds in four weeks, I can lose 10 to 15 in two weeks. Now that's the motivation we all need right after Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> uh, and going into the rest of the holidays, of course. All right, let's oh, look at this man. now. So Jordan Davis is going to be back there, albeit a lighter version of Jordan Davis. But he's going to be there with Ndamukong Sue. He's going to be there with Linval Joseph. He's going to be there with Fletcher Cox and then guys on the outside like Brandon Graham, Josh Sweat, Hassan Reddick hopefully being aggressive in this game, being allowed to be aggressive in this game, a buzzword that <laughs> seems to come up each and every week. But I'll ask you this, Seth. What really? How good can this defensive line be against a guy like Derrick Henry? Uh, you know the depth that they have now is you know especially on the interior when they need to play five man is just unheard of. I mean, you're talking about Andomik and Sue, who you really only need about 15 plays out of. Now that Jordan Davis is back, Linville Joseph, he'll only have to play about 15 to 20 plays a game. And then you got you know your old Star Wars. Um, you know, Fletcher, Fletcher Cox, Cox who's, who's now probably rejuvenated and motivated, you know, with the addition of the other guys. And Javon Hargrave, who's been who's off to, you know, a pretty decent year to begin with. So um, the depth is just unbelievable. We just we got to get the pressure off the ends with the defensive ends. Um, and if we can if we can get pushed there and those guys on the end can get can get around the corner. Um, I, I think we got some, and I and believe me, I know you. Everybody's concerned about Derrick Henry, but I'm gonna throw some stats at you guys today that's gonna blow your mind to get you to understand that this team is not a run-first team anymore. Mm. Wow. Oh okay. well, I will say this: Ryan Tannehill is not a great quarterback. He's not somebody that I'm overly concerned with if he's the quarterback that you're facing. But the term pick you apart does come to mind if you don't force him into making mistakes. You're looking at a guy over his last eight games, I believe. He's only thrown one interception. He only has four on the season in total. He's a guy that doesn't really make that mistake unless you make him make that mistake. And I know it comes up each and every week, and we tease it in the open. That word aggression or being aggressive comes up when talking about Jonathan Gannon. So when you look at this defensive line, will this be a weak gunner where you look at this defense and say, 
they're just going to let the defensive line eat. They're not going to send TJ Edwards. They're not going to send even Reed Blankenship, who we'll talk about a little bit more coming up, as he's going to get the start today at safety for the Eagles, filling in for uh, Charles Gardner-Johnson. So when you look at this defensive line, will they just be the ones concerned with getting the pressure, or do you see Jonathan Gannon manipulating his, his uh, linebackers and his secondary to try to force Ryan Tannehill into making mistakes? I've said it since day one of the season, and I'm going to say it again. The Eagles' four-man front by itself is not good enough to get home consistently. And they haven't proved me wrong up to this point. They're more effective when they go to the five-man front when they send the extra attacker. The problem is they don't like to blitz a whole lot. Now, in terms of making Ryan Tannehill make mistakes, Ryan Tannehill is a very efficient quarterback, not an elite quarterback. I don't even use the word great when I talk about a Ryan Tannehill. But he's been around the block for more than a decade. He's a smart quarterback, and there's a reason why he doesn't turn the ball over much. I think the biggest reason why Ryan T Tannehill has been a more efficient passer um, this year, maybe then more so than recent years, is because of the emergence of his young wide receiver, Traylon Burks. You know, he's a rookie. He was taking his time to really get acclimated to the NFL game. But over the last two games, Traylon Burks has 11 catches for 185 yards. So now he has another viable weapon. And when Seth said what he said a moment ago, I'm going to show you why this Tennessee team is not just a running team. That perked my, my interest. So I can't wait to hear his stats. But, you know, Ryan Tannehill, you have to make him make mistakes. He's not a great running quarterback. You can get to him. The frustrating thing is, will the Eagles deploy enough people to get to him and get him off his mark? Fair enough. Now, Seth, do any of your numbers have to do with the fact that over the last two weeks, Derrick Henry, in a run game at least, has been somewhat contained? No, three weeks. Three weeks I mean, now. It, go, weeks, it yeah. goes back three weeks. I mean, th these numbers are just mind-blowing. You know, Derrick Henry is averaging 21 carries a game for a paltry 59 yards. Yep. Wow. He's had one rushing touchdown over the last three weeks. Conversely, Ryan Tannehill is averaging right around 33 passes a game over the last three weeks. You know, roughly three, precisely 293 yards right. per game. And he's, had, he's thrown four touchdown passes. Now, that doesn't sound like the Tennessee Titans that we know that's just going to pound you into submission. But what you're starting to get is teams are starting to load the box with six, seven, eight guys. And when that's the case and you're holding um, Derrick Henry, last week he was held at 2.8 yards per carry. When you're holding him to that kind of number, you have no other choice but to play the cat and mouse game. The cat and mouse game is, okay, you got Robert Woods on one side, you got Traylon Burks on the other side, and if you're going to load the box, then Ryan Tannehill is going to have to throw the football. Mm -hmm. Now, what is Jonathan Gannon's game plan today? Are you going to load the box and try to stop um, Derrick Henry first, or are you going to – are you going to do it the other way around? You're just going to play your two high, and every time they see two high safeties, I can promise you they're going to check and they're going to run the football. All right. So how would you approach it today then? If well, you're listen, standing next to Jonathan Gannon on that sideline, how are you attacking this offense? I, I, I have to discourage them from trying to run the ball first. You know, um, I think that you know, we talked about it many times. The more apt they are, you know, to be able to run the ball, I think the more effective now that cat and mouse game, you know, it gets a little dicey because they can go play action pass off of those runs. And now, you know, your linebackers and your safeties aren't quite sure. But if I can take away Derrick Henry early and, and force their hand, especially if the offense, if we can play complimentary football, if the offense can get off to a great start, and I got another crazy stat for you on that <laughs> side of the ball too, but if the offense can get off to a great start and get a lead, you almost force their hand to have to throw the ball. And I would much rather have Ryan Tannehill throw the ball 30 to 40 times today than have Derrick Henry run that bad boy 35 to 40 times today. You know, to play off something Seth just said a moment ago is about Tannehill passing the ball for 293 yards on average over the last three games. That's a significant improvement for a team that was averaging under 176 yard passing the previous games as well. So basically, Tennessee has now become forced to be a more balanced offense out of necessity. As Seth talked about, Derrick Henry averaging 59 yards a game the last three games because, guys, teams are bringing people down in the box and loading the box and daring to throw them against them. My question to both of you, will Jonathan Gannon load the box? Listen, I mean, he, he – to me – Will Jonathan Gannon load the box? You want me to go first, Seth? No. 
<laughs> I'm just gonna. I mean, really, yeah. When I look at it, when I look at this particular game, and this is what we got into last week a little bit when we talked about why did the Eagles go out and get in Dominic and Sue and Linval Joseph and what game, if if any, above all the rest were circled on the calendar. I thought it was the Packers game over this one because this game with this defensive line allows Jonathan Gannon to do that thing that he loves to do, which is not be aggressive. It's to say to his front four. Go get it, fellas. Go win those battles while I have my corners 10 yards off the line of scrimmage yeah, playing the, soft zone. But the last week doesn't really buy into that theory. Okay. You know, because he's at a quandary. Like, to D. Gunn's point, we can't stop the run in our four-man front. So we have to play five-man front at least, at the, at the very least, on first and second down. Okay? Now, what does that do? That puts you at a deficit on the back end because you got one less guy in coverage. Then what does that do also? That forces Jonathan Gannon to be a little more afraid than he normally would be in the two high or the four-man line. And what is he going to do? He's going to play quarters coverage behind it. The safety is going to be off seven to ten yards. And Ryan Tannehill is savvy enough to look out there and see that and take the five-yard out or the stop route. I'm telling you right now. So it, it, it's, this is, to me, this is going to be the Eagles' toughest game of the season thus far. Uh, not only from a strategic standpoint, but after racking up 330, 363 yards rushing last week um, on 49 carries for three touchdowns, I can promise you Mike Vrabel's, you know, his, his commentary to his team is no, not on us, okay? So this is going to be a very physical game, a very tough, aggressive game, and the Eagles are going to have to answer the bell today. Um, and they might have to do some things on both sides of the ball that they really don't truly like to do in order to win this football game. There's one thing in particular on the offensive side I know we'll get into in a second here that the Eagles haven't done a whole lot of this year, but they have at least proven that they can play this version of football. They didn't do it so much last year, but this year certainly. By the way, this Eagles team at 10-1 and trying to be at 11-1 today, you can see them on New Year's Day, and here's how thanks to one of our great sponsors over at Pond La Hockey. Hey Philly, it's Tom Giordano from Pondley Hockey Giordano. Be sure to follow Pondley Hockey on Instagram for your opportunity to win free Eagles home game tickets for the rest of the season. You heard that right, we're giving away free tickets all season long. And guess what, we're gonna give away tickets to the playoffs and the Super Bowl. So make sure you're following us. And as always, thanks for watching the Pondley Hockey Post Game Show. Go Birds! Go Birds, indeed. All right, guys, talking about this defense, just one last thing. We've been talking about the secondary. We're talking about what Jonathan Gannon needs to do in this particular game. They are missing a key piece of the secondary, a guy that leads the NFL in interceptions right now in C.D. Deuce. He has been put on IR officially now. Reed Blankenship will be getting the start at the safety position today. Gunner, in his first game, first real snaps, really, I should say, right. as the Eagles safety, came up with interception on Aaron Rodgers. Not a bad way to start a safety career in the NFL. Had a couple of good hits in the game. Did get burnt by Christian Watson, as we saw, but a lot of people get burnt by Christian Watson, as it turns out. That whole uh, secondary that whole got burned <laughs> by Christian Watson. Marcus Epps even took the right angle and still yeah. got beat. Uh, when it comes to what they need out of uh, Reed Blankenship, will they get it today from him as a starting safety? Well, we went into the game last week wondering the same thing. Um, you know, when he was inserted, and he's going, he went up against a Hall of Fame quarterback, future Hall of Fame quarterback, and really shocked a lot of people with a, pleasantly by anticipating that throw from Rodgers and not just laying back and waiting for the tight end to catch the ball and then trying to make the tackle, but stepping up and making the interception. The Eagles have a lot of confidence in this young man in the back end. Obviously, he couldn't get a lot of playing time because of the guy in front of him who, oh, by the way, led the NFL in interceptions. There's a good comfort zone with him back there because of the other people they have around him. They still need to have Avante Maddox back there, and hopefully Avante's coming back next week. Uh, but as we speak right now, they have been impressed with the way this kid has gone about his business, how he's handled his business, and he plays fearless. Seth, what's a realistic expectation for Reed Blankenship today? Oh, I expect for him to play the same way he played last week. You know, the, listen, the, the most the interception wasn't impressive to me. You yeah. know what's impressive? What's that? See, most players in his position, being a rookie, being thrust into action, you know, unexpectedly, would have stayed behind the receiver right. and just ran up and made the tackle. To have the balls, <laughs> to have the balls to jump the route, are you kidding me? A rookie playing against Aaron Rodgers? Now, you know if he makes a mistake there and that guy and Aaron Rodgers pumps and that guy turns up the field at six points and this game, that game could have had a whole different you know, outcome. 
But to have the cojones to just to jump the route, to me, you know, that tells me a lot about his mindset. I don't think that, listen, he might not be as athletic as Gardner Johnson, but I get the sense that, you know, he's a playmaker. You know, I think that's just his mindset. And, and I watched him be really physical. I mean, he was – he was coming downhill just laying the wood on some people yeah. last week. And, I mean, I don't know if you've seen seen a picture of him on the sideline. He had a big old neck, big old Frankenstein head. And, and he just he, he just looked like he just looked like he's just like a battering ram. Like he's looking for something to hit. Yeah. You know, and and he's smart. I mean, you don't make plays like, like he made last week, that interception, without being smart. Now, correcting the angles, you know, that's something that's fixable. You know, get a little more depth, go a little wider, you know, so that you can use, you can cut him off and get some help. That's fixable. But the things, the intangibles that he brings to the table that we saw in a half of football or however long it was he played, you can't teach that stuff. That's innate. Yeah, it, it was great. And I said earlier in the week with your co-host, uh, Rob Ellis from Sports Take, right. uh, when I was on the Jacob Media YouTube channel talking about this game, one of the things that impressed me about that interception, he stayed low. When before he jumped the route, he stayed low to the ground as if to be hidden from Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. Couldn't see him past the line of scrimmage. And he, then he jumped the route and made the play. And, yes, he absolutely brought the wood in that game. Look forward to seeing him <laughs> do it again. Uh, also, looking at this game, one of the things we talked about, and Seth, you alluded to this earlier, I think, if I'm reading your mind correctly, this offense is not used to airing the ball out. They can do it, but they have mostly had their success over the last two years in running the football. Well, gentlemen, they are facing a pass defense that is ranked 31st in the NFL, the Tennessee Titans are today. So will this be a game that we look at and go, oh, they still got to run the football? And yes, I think you always got to set up the pass with the run, which is always great. But in this particular game, I won't be that surprised or that disappointed, especially if it's working, if the Eagles are exploiting a weak pass defense that they're facing today. Hey, listen. I don't care if they only run the ball 15 times a day. And I know y'all wouldn't take my temperature right now. <laughs> the Tennessee Titans are ranked third in the NFL. They give up 84.5 yards per game. I mean, you have to just – I mean, understand. That's on the ground. On the ground. On the ground. Yeah, yeah. That's 20 yards. That's roughly 21 yards per quarter. Okay? So now you can come into this game banging your head against the wall or you can come in doing the smart thing. They're giving up, they're, they're ranked 31st in the NFL against the pass, giving up 266 yards per game. And we've been crying all, for the last two weeks. Ever since that, oh, we can't throw the ball anymore. All we can do is run it. I'm tired of hearing it, okay, because at the beginning of the year, you know, we were throwing the ball pretty darn good. Jalen Hurts is sitting on 2,666 2, yards and 17 passing touchdowns, but we can't throw the ball. We put that nonsense to rest today because against one of the worst teams against the pass, I expect Jalen to throw that ball about 35 to 40 times today, and I'm okay with it. All right. Well, you know, you can throw the ball. You can run the ball as much as you want. You can talk about how porous they are in the pass game. The bottom line is, and I'm still trying to figure this out, Tennessee has not given up more than 20 points in like their last six consecutive games. So they'll give you enough. Are they a Jonathan Gannon type defense? They'll give you stuff underneath, but you're not getting across the Well, you know, the, the, the one area I forgot to research, D-Gun, now that you bring that up, yeah. is the um, is the red zone and the, and, and the, plus, the, plus, the plus side of the field. What are they doing in the red zone? They may be one of the best teams, you know, in the red zone because um, they're not going to give up. I mean, they got one of the best, you know, free safeties in bird in the league. So they're not going to give up a lot of deep balls. You're going to have to methodically work your way down the field. But what does that mean? That means that when you get in the red zone, now things get tighter. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, that's where that's where they're making it happen that they're not giving up a whole lot of yards, you know, a whole lot of points, I should say. Maybe in the red zone. All right. Now, when it comes to Jalen Hurts, a lot of people are talking about him. Patrick Mahomes, they're talking about Tua Tagovailoa as the guys that are going to be the MVP front runners right now with Patrick Mahomes most likely in that case. Does Jalen Hurts, to maybe further solidify his argument as at least being in the MVP conversation, does he need an air out game to try to prove to the rest of the league that he has got that arm? Because, I mean, we watch every snap, of course. Most people, of course, around the league, they watch every snap of especially a prime time game. But one of the most impressive things to me was that back shoulder throw he had to Quez Watkins in the end zone for the touchdown last week. He can do that on a regular basis. Last week, that's not what the game dictated. 
but it makes me feel a lot more comfortable that I know I have a quarterback that can make those types of throws. So does he need to have an off-the-charts type of throwing game in this particular game against the Titans, against this porous pass defense, to maybe solidify his argument a little bit further? No. Continue to play the game that got you this far. He's got almost 600 yards rushing. He has more rushing touchdowns than he does passing touchdowns. Continue to do what got you to the dance this far. You go back a few years, a quarterback named Lamar Jackson won the league MVP, but he had over 1,000 yards. He had more of a balance. He was more in – people were more in awe of him as a runner than they were as a passer. And I'm not saying that's, that's how Jalen Hurts is going to finish this season. But you don't go out of the norm. You know, to, 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 to get individual accolades. And if you talk to a Jalen Hurts, I don't even think he cares about individual accolades other than the team getting the W's, so to speak. If he continues to play his game as he has now, you look at how many rushing touchdowns he has as a quarterback compared to throwing touchdowns. He will be in that conversation until the end. As we all know, too, the MVP voting a lot of times is a popularity contest. Now, Patrick Mahomes has been down that road before, and that's all you hear across the nation right now, that Patrick Mahomes is the odds-on favorite. Well, he may be, but Jalen Hurts deserves to be in that conversation in the top two or three talked about. All right, let's go to Lincoln Financial Field now. Talk to our man, Eagles reporter, NFL insider for Jacob Media in a, a, a brisk, I'm told, Lincoln Financial Field press box. Still got the cap on. Uh, what's the weather like right now yeah. in Philadelphia, John? It's chilly, and I'm getting some Bob Groats early in the day. So. <laughs> yeah, it's very chilly. Uh, all right, one of the people that a lot of people are talking about today is obviously A.J. Brown going up against his former team. You were around him all, le all week in the locker room. I know he said all the right things about facing his former team. It's just another game. Yeah, it means something, but I still got to perform. I still got to do my job. Ball security, feeling 100% healthy, that whole thing. When it comes to A.J. Brown, what are you expecting from him today? Uh, you know, I, I am expecting a big game for A.J. I think for a couple reasons, Mark. The, the the obvious one, uh, he wants to prove that, uh, and he already said he, he's kind of won. He thinks the, the the shift from Tennessee to Philadelphia, but he obviously wants to prove to Tennessee what type of player he was. And for the most part, by the way, I think Mike Grable wanted to keep him. I think that was a difficult decision for the Titans organization because they're a run first team. So do you want to pay a receiver a hundred million dollar contract in that type of atmosphere. So it was a very difficult decision for Tennessee, but by no means does anybody in Nashville think A.J. Brown can't play. Still, there's the human nature aspect of wanting to play well against your former team. And then you come back to A.J.'s had some issues with the ankle first, then he got sick. Um, very uncharacteristic, losing fumbles two consecutive weeks. So he just wants to get back on track to get back on track and say, hey, I'm one of the best receivers in this league again. And then as you guys were talking about, I heard, you know, in theory on paper, Tennessee's very good against the run, very poor against the pass. So from that standpoint, it makes some sense to try to get A.J. Brown going. Hey, John, when Jordan Davis got hurt, uh, there were no uh, Linville Joseph and, and Damakon Sue in this locker room. Now that he's back and supposedly 15, 20 pounds lighter, and you have the addition of those beef eaters up front, what do you think his, his, his snap count will be? I said 18 to 20, 22 maybe, especially coming off an injury like that. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, D. Gunn, a little bit. I think if you look before the injury, it was slowly increasing. Yep. Um, but he has been out a month. I, th I do think it was a, a pleasant surprise that he actually lost weight uh, during the rehab because you're always concerned with big guys uh, in that type of situation. And there's no doubt that, that, that him keeping himself in shape was a, a really, really positive development. So from that standpoint, it's all positive. But as you mentioned, they didn't have Limbaugh Joseph when he went down. And all of a sudden you have this big nose tackle who can play the position, play it well, and understands how to play. He's a veteran. He's played for a long time. So it, it, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches in those odd man fronts. You can have Linball in there. You can rotate with Jordan Davis. I think it's going to be really big for the Eagles down the stretch of the season. But I do think it starts off slowly for Jordan Davis. Um, and and I do, you know, if you're looking about Derrick Henry and the Titans and stopping the run, that's sort of what's built into the Eagles' defense, right? They want to play light boxes, but 
they should play more five-man fronts against yep. Tennessee than they typically do. Hey, John, <clears throat> I know it's cold. You said it's chilly because, you know, the first thing us ball-headed guys do is we put a cap yeah, on our oh head. Yeah. When it gets <laughs> <out>. <laughs> um, so the real interesting thing is the quandary that the Eagles find themselves in offensively today. Um, you know, they're, they're probably ranked either one or two in rushing in the NFL after that 363-yard outburst last week, yet they're facing a team that is um, third against the run, giving up only 84.5 yards per, per game, and one of the worst teams versus the pass, ranked 31st in the NFL, giving up 266 yards through the air. Um, do we see a shift today in the mentality and the mindset uh, of the play calling by Shane Steichen, uh, or is it just business as usual? I think it's business as usual in the fact that, you know, I think we've seen this over really the past two years. Like they, when the Eagles get matched up against one of these teams that are good against the run on paper, whether it was New Orleans last year, was Washington earlier this year, now it's Tennessee. Um, you know, I think people forget that they're, they're good against a traditional running game. Um, there doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good uh, with the plus one of the quarterback. And if you want to take the Eagles out of the equation, look at teams against Chicago, who's not even a good football team. But they don't know what the heck to do to stop Justin Fields running the football when he's healthy. Uh, that plus one from the quarterback in the running game is really, really difficult to deal with. So I think when you say Tennessee's good against the run, you can say that. You can say convincingly, convincingly against a traditional running team the eagles are not um they have that plus one of the quarterback and that's why consistently they've been able to run against these great run defense teams over the past couple of years now while i say all that i do think yeah they look at tennessee's past defense and say there's some opportunities to get the football down the field i'm going to be interested because they haven't been the same passing offense since dallas goddard went down um, can that change today? It's going to be one of the more interesting things of this game in, in, in my mind. Uh, if you're the Tennessee Titans, John, I'm sure you're looking at Reed Blankenship right now as somebody that you're at least going to attempt to exploit. It's uh, quite the trade-off when you're talking about a guy leading the NFL with six interceptions in uh, C.D. Deuce being placed on IR and not going to be playing in this game, of course. So do you see Reed Blankenship rising to the occasion for this challenge and actually being one of those guys that the Eagles can rely on as that next man up mentality to give some very uh, important snaps to this Eagles defense? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, this is so interesting because, uh, you know, Kevin Byard, who's the Philly kid on, on, on the Titans, uh, two-time All-Pro safety, uh, went to Middle Tennessee State. Uh, and, and it's where Reed Blankenship uh, also went to Middle Tennessee State. And, they, they, you know, one of Kevin's nicknames is the mayor of, of Murfreesboro, which is where Middle Tennessee State is. And basically when he left – Reed came in, was one year in between, and was a five-year starter. So, you know, all of a sudden those Blue Raiders are just creating NFL safeties. Now, hopefully, Reed Blankenship becomes the type of player Kevin uh, Byer has been. I don't know if you're going to go down that route. But he, he did look really prepared, which kind of surprised me when forced into action for CJ last week. And I think one of the reasons why, and I talked to him, he, he started for five years in college. And granted, it wasn't Alabama, it wasn't Georgia, it wasn't even Tennessee. But when you play that much football, I think it helps. And I think it's helped him. But if you're looking at the Eagles objectively, yeah, I mean, that's my biggest concern. And it's not only Reed Blankenship, it's also Josiah Scott. So when you say you got to commit extra bodies, to defend against Derrick Henry in the run game. Well, you got to commit extra bodies to help Josiah Scott and Reed Blankenship on the back end. So what do you, you want to do? It's sort of a give and take. 
Hey, John, when you talk about a guy named Jeffrey Simmons, he reminds me a lot of a, a, a Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne down in Washington. He is one of the best in the business at his position. What do you do to neutralize him? What should the Eagles do to neutralize him? Do you run right at? Do you go right at him, or do you isolate him and stay away from him at all possible cost? Yeah, he reminds me of Fletcher when Fletcher was in his prime. Yep. That's that's the type of player he is. Um, you know, he's a little banged up. Hopefully, that helps. But he's not the kind of guy. You know, he's the kind of guy you game plan for, um, and you're not trying to take advantage. Of anything he does. You're trying to, you know, Nick Sirianni joked earlier this year when he was talking about Micah Parsons, you know, if you can't block him, read him. Um, Because the Eagles knew they couldn't block him. Uh, But that's an edge player. When you have somebody inside like Jeffrey Simmons, you just got to sort of do the best you can do. You got a game plan. You know, this is one of the best defensive players in football for people who don't know. Uh, and he's going to be tough. He's yeah. he's the guy. He's he's the guy you gotta you gotta deal with and and your game planning for. John, you know, I I'd, I'd given anything to be in Tennessee this week when uh, Mike Vrabel, um, you know, addressed his team. You know, after watching what the Eagles did and scored putting up forty points last week, um, we know that that team is built on old school principles. Um, do the Eagles get the sense, I mean, have you been able to gauge, do they get the sense that this potentially could be the toughest game that they play all year um, just from a physical, aggressive, toughness standpoint? I, I, I think it is. I think it's going to be the most physical game they play. Yeah, it's funny because the first two words everybody says about Mike Rabel's team is tough and physical. I mean, literally, everybody, first two words out of their mouth. Um you know, the Eagles pride themselves uh, on being more physical uh, than most teams because it, it, it generally comes down to their offensive and defensive lines. This is one week where I'm not saying Tennessee's more physical, but they're as physical as the Eagles. So, yeah, I mean, that's how Mike Brable, you know, A.J. Brown was talking about it. A.J., you know, said – Mike Brable's the kind of guy you can have two or three people at the bar and he'll he'll convince you that you can beat 20 people up in a bar fight. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he is. And that he wants his football team to be like that. Mm-hmm. And he's generally built them like that. This will be the fourth consecutive year they make the playoffs. They are a very, very tough and physical team. And, yeah, that'll be a, a, a big test for the Eagles because typically they win that category. By the way, Seth, uh, Bob Garotz is – not uh, being a pain in the butt next to me. He said, Merrill, Merrill still is talking about the outstanding job you did on the show. So Merrill <laughs> Reese giving you a shout out. Uh, tell him I said thanks, man. <laughs> uh, John, before we let you go, uh, uh, in the brisk uh, arena that is uh, Lincoln Financial Field right now, what is your prediction for Titans-Eagles today? You know, I, I, I'm picking the Titans to win the game, not because I think they're a, a better team, I just been. I haven't picked the Eagles to lose a game all year. I I picked them to not cover the spread, but I haven't picked them to lose a game all year. Obviously, I was wrong uh, with Washington. This was the first one I looked at and said, "Well, this might be kind of a logical loss." Um, it's hard to win seventeen games. It's hard, it's hard to go sixteen and one. I think there's a couple losses on the schedule. This is maybe a logical one, but I think it's going to be really close. It's going to come to, down to a field goal either way in the fourth quarter. But I picked the Titans. I'm sticking with the Titans. Hey, no, no score right there? No, hey, no. Hey, hey, John. Uh, 24-23. Uh, that hey, close. Hey, John, they still, they still have the nerve to open the windows early in the morning <laughs> and so you can get so-called the ambiance. I used to tell, hey, man, close those windows, man. What are you doing? Now, yeah, you know, the windows are, are closed, but I think it's the, uh, the, the thinnest glass in the history of the world, PK. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, they're closed, but I don't know if you can tell they're closed. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I don't think I like uh, beanie cap uh, John McMullen. He starts oh, picking against on. the birds. I, do. It makes I don't him, know. It, I think it makes him look more menacing. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Uh, there John, we go. John, thanks so much. Appreciate you. Our NFL insider for Jacob Media, John McMullen, joining us from Lincoln Financial Field. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, guys. Just uh, throws a beanie on. All of a sudden, he picks against the Eagles. I won't stand for it. I won't stand for it. All right. We'll be back with more Eagles coverage here on the Jacob Media pregame show from Ocean Casino.